Hello everybody, this is Dr Christopher White and welcome back for part 3 of the Precambrian and its life history, focusing on the Proterozoic Eon part 2. So before we go any further, let's just get the code word out of the way. The code word for this presentation is CAT, I repeat CAT, so that's C-A-T, CAT as in the pet. So please make sure you write that down, put it somewhere safe because you're going to need it for the code word quiz. Okay. Let's get looking at multicelled organisms. So the Proterozoic is important because it's the first time that we begin to see multicelled organisms appearing in the fossil record. And they're going to appear right towards the end of the Proterozoic. So a multicelled organism is not simply a mass of the same cells, because that would technically be a colony. So what it is, is it's a grouping of cells that have specific functions. So we know that multicelled organisms had appeared by the end of the Neoproterozoic, but the timing of the transition and the evolutionary path taken to get there are uncertain. Now, the reason for this is quite obvious. These are soft bodied organisms we're talking about here. So they don't really fossilize very well. So the fossil record of how we got from single celled organisms to multicelled organisms is pretty patchy. There's no denying it. So modern studies of extremely simple multicelled organisms containing four identical cells, each capable of living independently, has given us some hints about how the early stages of multicelled organ well the early development, should I say, of multicelled organisms happened. So the model proposes that cells within a colony of the same single celled organism might have become slightly specialized. So for instance, let's say, you know, you have a group of cells and maybe one of those cells is, let's say, able to produce the uh, chemical ATP in slightly higher abundances than the other cells nearby. Well, ATP is a chemical that you can use essentially for energy. So if you have a cell that produces excess amounts of ATP, it can then obviously give it to the surrounding cells. It can help to take some of the stress off them, make their lives easier. So if you have a cell that has a specialization which will help the cell and other cells nearby survive, well, those cells will be more likely to survive and reproduce successfully. So by developing groups of cells within a community that perform a specific function, so something like maybe respiration or the production of you know, uh, molecules that are used for energy, so like ATP, or maybe you know, the ability to produce certain enzymes, what that does is it actually helps to take some of the weight off the other cells in the group. Now, this means that if there is another cell that is itself slightly specialized for some purpose, you know, maybe let's say it's not, you know, maybe it's specialized to make a particular type of enzyme, but on the other hand, it's not great at respiration. So normally this cell, because it's not, you know, the, the fittest cell, it would typically die off. However, let's say there's another cell nearby, which is very efficient when it comes to respiration. And as such, it can help that cell to survive. Well, that means these two cells have entered a, a relationship, essentially, with one cell helping the other. And the, you know, the cell that's being helped, which can produce the enzyme, can then secrete that enzyme, which may be of assistance to other cells in the group. So what you can see very quickly what's going to happen is you're going to get cells which are going to become specialized for a particular purpose or purposes. And, you know, they're going to essentially rely on the other cells in the group for their survival. Now, this is obviously going to be a very hit and miss process. So, but eventually what you're going to end up with are relatively simple organisms like sponges that have specific cells for reproduction, some cells for respiration, and some cells for food collection. And by that I mean, you know, eating and digestion. So, as you can see, it, it doesn't take too much, you know, to actually get to a very, very you know, relatively simple multi-celled organism. So we can actually see in the fossil record for the Proterozoic that there are numerous carbonaceous impressions of multicelled algae from the Proterozoic. So we have these, essentially these, here's one here, carbonaceous impression. Uh, this one's from Montana. And in this case, it's a multicelled algae. Now, obviously the problem is in these situations is we don't really know whether what we're looking at is a colony of the same cell or whether what we're looking at is an organism that actually has 
uh, cells which are specialized for particular uh, processes, particular uses. So, you know, obviously just having the impression itself is, you know, doesn't really tell us that much. What it does tell us, though, is that we did have these groups of multi, well, we had these uh, colonies or animals which consisted of multiple cells. Now, one of the questions is, though, is, well, why are we moving from a single-celled setup to a multi-celled setup? I mean, after all, single-celled organisms are actually extremely effective. So the problem is, is that single-celled organisms can only grow to a set size. They can't get particularly big because they're constrained by their surface area to volume ratio. So essentially, as you start getting too large, your volume is getting bigger, but your surface area is having difficulty keeping up. And so obviously, as you get bigger, you're going to need more nutrients in order to survive. But the surface area isn't increasing at the same rate as the volume does. So this means your volume is shooting up, but your surface area isn't increasing anywhere near as quickly. And obviously, smaller surface area means you have a, a reduced capacity to actually bring material into your cell. So essentially, there is a maximum size that a cell can get to before it starts to essentially not function very efficiently. So cells are actually more efficient when they begin to form organs. So once you take your cells and they actually begin to specialize into groups which have specific jobs, well, then all of a sudden things begin to become a lot easier. So, you know, some of the processes that a cell would normally do get taken over by another group of cells and it leaves, you know, that cell free to do some other task. And as such, you know, we have these symbiotic relationships between all these cells. They all rely on each other to survive and they all, as a, you know, as a group, help to make each other's lives that little bit easier. So... This process then brings us on to the Neoproterozoic, so the late Proterozoic, and more importantly, the Idiocarian fauna. So in the modern world, the distinction between plants and animals is clear. So, you know, we can see differences in things like, you know, styles of reproduction, metabolic processes, you know, the, uh, the organelles inside cells, those kinds of things. However, the line was blurred for early multicellular life. So the first indicators of complex multicelled life come from the Idiocarian fauna of Australia and other sites of the same age. So in 1947, R.C. Spriggs went and identified impressions of soft-bodied organisms in the Pound Quartzite in the Idiocara Hills of South Australia. So the fossils recovered over several trips bore little resemblance to modern species. So the Idiocaran fauna answered one question that had been bugging geologists who were assuming that the diverse fauna of the Cambrian must have had a long and complex history. So one of the problems that geologists had was when we look at the rock record, we see all of a sudden as you go from the Precambrian into the Cambrian, all of a sudden life explodes. And the life that appears in the Cambrian, it has hard shells or they have skeletons in some cases. Now, this is a little bit difficult, though, because if you think about it, we have these single celled organisms in the Precambrian. And then all of a sudden, as soon as we hit the Cambrian, we have complex multi celled life with hard shells. Now, that's quite a jump. So what you really need is you need to be able to see the intermediate steps. And up until the Idiocarian fauna, we couldn't see the intermediate steps. But once we found the Idiocarian fauna, they help us to essentially fill the gap between single-celled organisms and the complex multi-celled life that really begins to appear in the Cambrian. So what the Idiocarian fauna demonstrated was that multi-celled life evolved extremely quickly, leading to the sudden increase in organisms after 541 million years. That's the start of the Cambrian. So this sudden increase in you know, the number of organisms is referred to as the Cambrian explosion. And so what we can see from the... Um, from the Idiocarian fauna is that in the last, you know, few tens of uh, millions of years of the Proterozoic, that's when they make their appearance and, you know, the, num the number and distribution of the Idiocarian fauna shoot up and that takes us into the Cambrian and then those animals evolve further to develop hard shells. 
So in 2018, uh, analysis of a fossil of an organism called Dickinsonia managed to identify cholesterol molecules within the fossil. Now, these cholesterol molecules are actually leftovers from the animal itself, but the most important thing is that cholesterol is pretty much uh, an animal cell product. So the particular type of cholesterol they managed to analyze only really comes from animal cells, and so this proves definitively that Dickinsonia is the, is the oldest example we have of an animal. So it's, you know, it's not a plant, it's an animal, it's clearly an animal, and we have the analysis of the cholesterol molecules to tell us this. So uh, an analysis of the Idiocarium fauna suggests that three present-day phyla are represented within the fossils that were found. So the three phyla that we think are represented in the Idiocarium fauna are the Nidaria, the Annelida, and the Arthropoda. So in terms of the uh, Nidaria, what we're looking at here is a group that includes the jellyfish and the sea pens. So this is a group of organisms that are soft bodied, they're invertebrates, they have radial symmetry, and they tend to have uh, tentacles which have stinging appendages. So you can see here, this is the, uh, the, the Idiocarian fauna fossil in question that we think belongs to this group. So you can see, essentially, it has an approximately circular shape. You can see the ridges quite clearly. And you can also see that it has three distinct lines on it. So there's one here, one here, and one here. So if we look at this, this is an artist's impression of what we think it looked like. So we think it was probably, uh, probably would be on the seabed. We obviously can see it's an invertebrate, so it's soft-bodied. We can see the grooves quite clearly on the surface there. And this is inferred that it probably had tentacles on the bottom that may have been able to sting. And just for comparison, you can look at a modern jellyfish over here, and you can quite clearly see the similarities. So the next phyla we're going to think about are the Annelida. So this essentially are, these are the segmented worms. So as you can see here, we've got a picture of a leech over here, and you can see the body is split into individual muscular segments, which allows it to move efficiently. And so here's Dickinsonia. So this is the uh, oldest known animal. This is the uh, one we were just talking about, where they managed to analyze a fossil of Dickinsonia, and they managed to identify cholesterol molecules related to animal cells. And once again, you can quite clearly see the segmented body shape. You can see the segments really very clearly indeed. So the final phylum is the group Arthropoda. And so the, the group Arthropoda essentially is a group of organisms that tends to have, that have shells made of overlapping plates. So it includes groups like insects and arachnids. So if we look at the fossils that we have from the Idiocarium fauna, here's one of the fossils right here. So you can see it's quite long there. But you can see the individual plates quite clearly in the fossil, and you can see the, the head of the organism right there. And so this is a reconstruction of what we think it looked like. And we can compare that to a, a, a Cambrian arthropod, in this case a trilobite. You can see the very strong similarities between the two. So there may also have been primitive echinodermata within the Idiocarium fauna as well. So echinodermata are starfish and sea urchins, although there is more disagreement about those fossils, so we're not really going to, any, going to go into any great detail about them. So the study of similar aged rocks from Namibia, Canada and Russia has yielded similar soft-bodied organisms which are all lumped together as the Idiocarian fauna. But this is quite important because essentially we have examples of the Idiocarian fauna from every continent with the exception of Antarctica. So this tells us that these particular animals were clearly very, very widespread, which would suggest they were quite a successful group. The problem is, of course, is that due to the fact that they didn't have a hard skeleton, fossils of them are, on the whole, relatively rare. So, do we have any other information about what was going on in terms of multicelled life at the end of the Proterozoic? Well, it looks like we might have found what appear to be jellyfish impressions in rocks that sit 2,000 metres below the pound quartzite. So if you remember, the pound quartzite is the layer of rock in which the first Idiocarian fauna fossils were identified. 
Now, the one thing we don't know about this layer of rock is its age. We can't date it. So we don't know whether these jellyfish, what well, just a possible jellyfish impressions, were you know represent animals which were around 100 million years before the Idiocarian fauna appeared, or just 1 million years before the Idiocarian fauna appeared. So although we don't have you know any direct dating evidence, you know it would suggest that there may have been jellyfish-like organisms in existence before the Idiocarian fauna occurred. Now, on top of that, we also have rocks from China, which show numerous burrows. And these rocks are dating date to about 700 million years in age. So this is, once again, very late Proterozoic. Also in rocks from China, we have what appear to be possible worm fossils, which date between 900 and 700 million years old. Once again, very, very late Proterozoic. So this, these organisms would probably fall into the uh, phynum uh, Annelida, so these segmented worms. So once again, it would suggest that you know maybe the uh, the phyla actually predated the Idiocarian fauna. Now, when it comes to skeletons, that was a very big step as we transition from the Precambrian to the Cambrian. So as I mentioned, as we move into the Cambrian, we start to see organisms that have hard exoskeletons and occasionally what appear to maybe be uh, hard internal skeletons. Now, in terms of finding organisms from the Proterozoic that have uh, shell-like, well, that have shells or internal skeletons, we haven't really done particularly well. It would seem that most organisms were soft-bodied. However, we do have scraps of what appears to be shell-like material within, pre, uh, within Proterozoic sedimentary rocks. And in some cases, we also have what appear to be tooth-like, they're called denticles. So think of them like a scale on a fish, for instance. So they, essentially, it's a, um, it's a, it's a, a, a piece of essentially hardened uh, organic material and they overlap to form a, a crude shell. And so we see these uh, fragments of shell-like material and these denticles within late Proterozoic sediments. Now that would suggest that we do have animals around which may have had complete or partial skeletons. However, we don't really have the fossils of those organisms, so we can't honestly say, you know, yes, they were shells, you know, and this is what they look like. Now, we think there may have been some, some organisms that had a chitinous carapace. So chitin is the material that insect shells are made from. Now, one uh, species in particular is called Kimberella. And if we look at the fossil here, we can see that Kimberella essentially has this, what looks like a, almost a, a pleated edge. You can see it around here. So we think that's the edge of the animal itself. But this area in the middle here appears to be some kind of hard defensive structure. Now, as far as we can tell, it doesn't seem to be made of a mineral, so it's not made of calcium carbonate. We think it's probably organic in origin, and so we think the most likely material it can be made from is probably chitin, like an insect shell. But nevertheless, this would appear to be you know, possible evidence of organic shells existing within the Idiocarian fauna. And uh, just one final thing, these types of shells would be similar to the types of shells we get in the group of uh, animals which we call brachiopods, which are a type of, uh, they're a mollusk-like creature. So to finish, we have a diagram here that just kind of summarizes some of the Idiocarian fauna that we, uh, that we see towards the end of the Proterozoic. So obviously we have our Dickinsonia fossil here, right here, as you can see, one of the largest uh, members of the uh, Idiocarium fauna. We have a, uh, a Kimberella fossil right here, the one we're just talking about with this, what could be a chitinous uh, carapace, a chitinous shell. We have our, our uh, jellyfish-like organisms sitting right here. And we have our arthropod-like organism, um, Sprigina, right here. Now then there's also a whole range of other organisms and these ones are a little bit more difficult to know whether they're plants or animals but they also uh, occur within the Idiocaria hills and so we can classify them as part of the Idiocarium fauna although whether they're plants or animals is a little bit less certain. Okay everybody so that's it for this presentation so thank you for watching and have a good day.